She's a doctor. Hi, I'm Dr. Dobek, and she's a dietitian. Hey, I'm Hannah Schuyler, and together we are the The Doctor Dietitian Dietitian Collab. Collab. Today we've got Ashlyn with us. Yes, we have Ashlyn Douglas Barnes, who is a licensed clinical social worker who is doing all the big things in the bariatric community. And she had surgery herself. So she has an incredible compassion and empathetic perspective that I think makes her one of the best in the game when it comes to the head work and the mental health aspect of all of this. So welcome, Ashlyn. Yay. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm super excited to talk all things bariatrics and emotions today, as this is sometimes the part that really catches people off guard is like what I even have to do with any of this. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let's, let's get, get in here with the, the big emotions and let's just rip the mandate off and talk about it. How do you look at this when you're, when you're talking to a patient, you know, starting before surgery. And I know that you're also very involved in this sort of the workup, the evaluations, maybe even some therapy or, you know, doing a little bit of work beforehand. How does that look in the preparation phase for surgery? Yeah. So sometimes that part is tough because people are so excited and they are just, they just want to have surgery. They're going to tell me exactly what I want to hear. I'm good. I'm fine. I'm Mm. totally adjusted. I I'm going to have this surgery and I'm going to be great. And so I tend to focus on kind of education on like how to know when to come back to me and things to look out for. But I think that occasionally I do have people who will come in and just be flat out honest and be like, yeah, I'm having this surgery because I want to look good. And uh, i don't really want to change a lot of what's going on in my life. That's more rare. Most of the time people Mm -hmm. come to me and they're like, I've got a lot of health reasons. I live, I'm in Orlando with, with Dr. Dovic. So, you know, I want to be able to go to um, the rides at Disney and fit and be around for my children. And I probably need some help, but I really don't want to delay this whole, Mm -hmm. you know, situation. So Uh, can I work with you or can we work on something? So in the beginning, it's tough because there's just a lot of excitement and it's like, I'm going to do what I need to do and get right into it. But I think if you were someone who wanted to be proactive and look at the things that, you know, try to figure out the things that you need to work on before surgery, we can almost always work in tandem. So we can move you forward with getting your surgery and we'll work on the stuff that you want to work on because chances are we can, we can work on them like in vitro, like we want you to be able to have those experiences and then come back and say, how did it go before you even have surgery? And so we can work in tandem with having surgery. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's super important. And I, and I get the excitement. I mean, Mm -hmm. I'm probably guilty of trying to get patients to that moment because as you know, I mean, this is a huge decision, a very, very long time coming decision. Like I've thought about it forever. I didn't know. And then like when the switch goes off, you're like, I'm doing it. Yeah. I'm like I'm committing to this big, huge life change. I can see my future. I'm manifesting it. I want it. And I want it like now, like when you see that, it's like, okay, we get your sense of urgency. We want to help you too. And so I think that whole piece, the psych piece, it gets caught up in it as if it's like, let's go get married. Let's go to Vegas tonight, baby. And (laughs) let's, you know, let's get hitched. And and that's what you're doing. And then you kind of wake up and you're like, Oh, I'm, I'm all in. I quite literally woke up from anesthesia and I, I don't know what I'm doing now. So I don't know, like, how do you keep the excitement going and also make sure that, you know, you're, you've done the necessary work. Yeah. Yeah, that one's tough because what I tell people too is there's nothing I can tell you right now that is going to make you believe how you will feel after surgery. Mm. If it, when people told me about what they thought the surgery could do, I thought in my head, well, that's other people because nothing else has worked. Uh, so I, I won't get excited because if it doesn't work, I don't want to be disappointed. Mm. But it is amazing for people, particularly who've never been kind of explained why this is occurring, you know, the pancreas connection and cylinders that like why this is occurring to begin with and why surgery is different than maybe other things that they've tried, like diet and exercise plans. So I think I try to remind people like we will figure that out then. Let's keep the excitement and, and that rolling through. And if you're a little afraid or scared, that's totally OK, because yeah. That also lets me know you're like here on earth with me. Uh, yeah, you're in reality. I like that. You, know, you know, you're in reality that like, yeah, this is scary. And and it we don't exactly know what's going to happen. And we don't we don't know how you will feel and all that. And that's OK. 
Um, yeah. So let's figure out what we can figure out now and we'll figure out what we can figure out then. I can tell you scientifically what we believe will happen or uh, what we've observed in other clients who've you know had surgery, why I think this would be different than another attempt that you've taken. Um, and really that education around this is not your fault. Uh, this is yeah. a metabolic condition that is that is happening in your body. I think that is missed so much um, because so many of my clients have never even heard that. Uh, so many of my friends that have come to me, they're like, I'm not eating that much and no one believes me. And I'm like, oh, I do. This is insulin yeah. resistance. Like this is insulin yeah. resistance at its absolute best. Uh, it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do because it believes it's keeping you alive by doing this or it wouldn't do it. And I think that trying to just be in curiosity, I wonder mm. if it did work, what would mm. that look like? If I allowed oh my myself to be excited so much of this curiosity too, I love curiosity. Uh, <laughs> if I allowed myself to be ex excited because I maybe think that maybe it could work, even if you're not going to agree with me that it will work, could you believe that it could work? Mm. And what would that look like if you, if it could work or would work? What would your life look like? So you can start thinking of those things. Cause I often ask in, in pre-surgical evaluations, what is something not weight related that you're looking forward to? Because mm. I want them when they do that to click in, to be like, oh, this was the thing I wanted to go ride the ride. You know, my final straw was I tried to get on this ride. I couldn't get on the ride. It was the most embarrassing situation ever in front of my son. I had to get off the ride and leave mm -hmm. and this whole thing. I want to be able to go get on the ride, not think about it, ride the ride, enjoy myself, not worry about all that. So then when that client actually does that, even if they're in the middle of that, I haven't lost enough and I don't know why this is, they're like, oh, this was the thing I said I yeah. wanted to do and I did it. So I try to get them to start imagining like what their life could look like if if they had surgery and it worked. Yeah. That's such a, it's so funny. Just going back to what you're saying, where you're talking to them about like the insulin and the, the metabolic things. And like, yeah. I have those same exact conversations with patients because they're like, you know, of course, being the dietitian, they come, they're telling me, what do they eat? And they're like, I really don't eat that much. I'm like, well, first of all, that's a lot of people's problems, but I'm like, yeah, no, it's fine. Like I, I, it's okay. Like we're, we're going to get you. And I was like, usually I tell them to eat more and they're <laughs> surprised, but um, it's like, yeah, this is different. And, and from a, for me, what I sometimes experience with people is I find that the pre-op changes are a lot more difficult than the post-op because they don't have yeah. these hormonal and metabolic changes, which is where then, you know, thinking of that, that mind body connection is so important because it's almost like, well, now it's like willpower. It's the desire to do it. And it's overcoming the habits that people have had for 30, 40, 50 years you know, expecting to change their, their habits before surgery. And I think that's where, you know, working, working on the mental side and, and a little bit maybe with like the emotional eating and mm -hmm. things like that is so important as well. So what would you say is the biggest advice that you do give to say, you know, okay, let's, let's put ourselves there. Let's, if it did work, curiosity, use your imagination. Ooh, what could life be like? Why is it worth going through a surgery and the physical discomfort and all of this work? So what are some things you tell them to expect for when they wake up from surgery from an emotional standpoint? Yeah. So first we talk about like the beginning part is really challenging and that's normal. And some people wake up and we're talking like get home. We're not going to talk about actual like anesthesia response, but you get home. It may be really challenging to drink fluid and yeah. that may be incredibly frustrating. You're probably sitting here pre-surgery thinking, why would that be really frustrating? Because that's going to be your entire life, 24 hours yeah. a day, to just drink fluid. And that's okay. You're going to have points where you may regret what you did. Totally normal. It's a point of frustration, probably lack of ability to sleep or, or regulate or even like temperature regulate sometimes. So, so there's certain things that you may find yourself, but don't worry. Those mm -hmm. are temporary situations. Um, particularly if you wake up, I always warn them to, you find out that your gallbladder is removed. You had a hernia repair. I had a hernia yeah. repair outside of bariatric surgery. That thing was painful. I can't imagine having that on top of yeah. a surgery. So I had, you know, I had a client that came to you that had a bunch of other uh, lesions and things that happened and she was in a lot of pain and she's like, what is happening here? And I was like, girl, she like rearranged and had to deal with all those lesions. You know, like, yeah, I would imagine you're in some pain here. So yeah. kind of reminding them that, you know, you need to be aware of like, what did we actually do? Like in the end, like, did we pull up a gallbladder? Did your appendix not look great? Did we, did you have a hernia? Did we need to repair something? Because then we're going to have to add some 
recovery time, which makes sense. Um, but from in the beginning, things may be frustrating and that is okay because we actually, you know, your stomach has to heal, but still be a stomach. That's the one thing that like, clients will come and be like, it's really hard to drink. I'm like, yeah, we like chopped your stomach up and then we sewed yeah. it back. We said, Hey stomach, we need you to continue to be a stomach, but also heal. So that's mm -hmm. normal expected. Um, and for other people, they'll actually tell me like my recovery was a lot less crazy than I thought it would be. I felt totally fine. Um, oh, that yeah. was for my recovery, I accidentally um, chugged a bottle of water on the way home and then sat there assuming I would die uh, oh, because wow. we weren't supposed to do that. Yeah, I don't know how I did that. Uh, so I had no issues with fluid. I had no, you know, I walked up three flights of stairs when I got, like, I felt fine. And I kind of like sat there and I was like waiting, like, oh, the bad things. Yeah. Happen. Um, but I think that all of those things can be normal post-surgery. We won't kind of know until we get there, but kind of focusing on what's your why. What was the reason that you did this to begin with? You want to get off all those diabetes medications. It drives you nuts that you have to like track every morsel of food because you're trying to figure out your sliding insulin. Um, are you wanting to be able to travel more and it's so uncomfortable at this point? Are you trying to conceive? I have a lot of younger clients that are trying to conceive. Mm -hmm. yes, so like yeah. the, the longer term goal here will be worth it. But in those moments where you regret it, that's okay too. Like you can be appreciative that you had the opportunity and really pissed that you're currently in this position at the same time. And it doesn't mean anything about you as a person. It just means Me you're 4 really AM. Which yeah. is <laughs> right, right, right. So I, I work with, yeah, exactly. I work with postpartum. Um, and well, I have another certificate postpartum and a lot of that, I, I do a lot of infertility work. It's like the same thing. They're like, I really wanted this. I worked on it for like 10 years. I spent, you know, a house worth of money and now, like, I don't know if I'm up for this. And it's like, yeah. Reality yeah. hits. Yeah. Totally, wow. totally that, understand that, that one was me too. Yeah. 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 And so I think that yeah. like normalizing that, because again, like what people see on social media and they're like, oh, everything's great. I'm fine. Or they yeah. see like the opposite, like their lives are they're super crazy complications. Things are incredibly rare and really, you know, they'll see that and then they'll see like people are fine. So they don't kind of see that in between and that yeah. this temporary situation that we will figure out a way like if there is something going on like we will figure out a way to figure that out but it's okay if in four at four o'clock in the morning where you just want to go to sleep and you're like I don't understand why my body's still awake and then I say it's because your metabolism is literally revving up and your body could physically feel it <laughs> it is funny like that um and again they're like oh well that makes a lot more sense so I'm like yeah so just focus on resting versus sleeping yeah. And then yes. that will be less frustrating and more likely is you'll sleep. But I would expect that your sleep is a little off right after surgery because your body is going through quite a change and you might've taken a nap at three o'clock in the afternoon today. Uh, and now you're trying to go to bed at eight and maybe that's not working. So kind of normalizing, educating, but also reminding them it's temporary. Yes. Such great advice. And I like that a lot. You've said a lot of things like, oh, I got to use that. I should be taking notes here um, <laughs> on this. Uh, but just, yeah, like just rest. And that's a win right there. It's a lot. You're sore. You're tired. There's that early period. And, you know, we recently did a podcast with Laura Grabo, who is also, I know you know her. She's great in this whole space that, that we're in. And she talked about the post-op period and the phases or the waves, as she put it, of grief. And even the way you're describing it is very much so like that. You, you just said, like, maybe you're frustrated and angry that you mm -hmm. can't drink water at the speed that you once did. And you're angry that you have to track your food or sad. And I just felt like, gosh, that was also such a great um, way of putting into perspective that you will get to acceptance. This will be, you're saying it's temporary. This, this will, this too shall pass. And you know, how do you, how do you get there? How do you, um, how do you feel about that as a, a good analogy as to the yeah. early post op periods? Definitely. There's a lot of grief around also letting go the idea I think what hits a lot of people and what hit me too was that this truly was a medical condition that was outside of my control. Yes, and it, it is. really was painful to know that because so many people had told me otherwise. So yeah. for bariatric surgery to work meant all the messaging that I received from everyone in my life was incorrect. And so mm -hmm. that it's also something where it's like, because if I had failed, then it would have been like, okay, well, it's all correct. And, you know, like I failed and this really is my fault and I can deal with that. But dealing with the idea that doctors uh, 
Weight watch, yeah, all the things I did were not mm-hmm. like that. I think is part of the grief process that we don't often talk about because that is a really hard, you know, societal da 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 da. If like mm-hmm. if this truly was a medical condition, why didn't someone do something about it a long time ago? Mm-hmm. And if this truly was what was happening, why couldn't it be fixed without me going to this? I think that's also that anger. Why did I have to go to this this level? And at that time, it was a little, it was 12 years ago. So it's a little, um, the surgery is a bit different than it is now. But it's like, why did I have to go there in order to get this fixed when this was like a medical, like all that messaging that I had received? So I do think that's part of that anger acceptance, even yeah. though our brain says that should be relieving, right? So my brain says, yo, Ash, that should be relieving that this isn't your fault, but it actually caused anger um, mm-hmm. and sadness and all of the relationships people hid or, um, you know, I think I had an ex that kind of did me in, you know, like wouldn't, wouldn't be with me in front of other people because like of my size or what was going oh, wow. on. So mm-hmm. I think that's one of the, like, all of that was like, that had nothing to do with me. And then I think the biggest adjustment post-op is deciding who you're going to be now. Mm-hmm. Now, knowing that you don't have to be the best friend, the people pleaser, the everything for everybody who are you going to be now? And how are you going to deal with the people that no longer want to be with you now, who are going to say the surgery changed you, who are going to say, um, you know, I I didn't think this was who you really, you know, I don't know, whatever they say. I remember I had a friend that was like, uh, she had been kind of distant. I came to her and I was like, you know, what's going on? She's like, well, I just thought when you lost all the weight, you become a bitch. And I was like, well, oh. I think I just in me but smaller, <laughs> in a smaller yeah. body. I don't, I don't think I had, I, I laughed. I said, I don't think I had a personality transplant. I'm still me, right. but I think that, uh, and it took me a lot longer uh, to develop, decide who I was going to be. In the beginning, I, I just figured I'd be the same me because that would be a lot easier. Um, so continue all of those things that helped me. Um, and again, getting into like therapy stuff, The underlying feeling there, so in therapy, we call that core belief, is you're only worthy of being on this earth if. I'm only uh, only worthy worthy of being on this earth if I'm producing, if I am the best friend, if I, not just because I'm here. And so the biggest shift in therapy for a lot of people is just removing that if and being Mm -hmm. like, I'm worthy of being on this earth because I am a human being and I am here. And that is a very big shift because historical messaging around because you're in a larger body, you're you're you shouldn't be in this space. And so that is a really big shift for a lot of people to one, recognize and feel the pain and anger of that and work through that and decide who am I going to be on on the other side. And that's something that we don't really talk from a medical standpoint, because we're just like, you did great. Yeah, Yeah, you lost weight, like, great. And they're like, okay, well well, what am I doing now about all, you know, all this other stuff? Yeah. I'm like, oh, that's, that's, a, that's, that's you and the therapist, you know, you and the therapist yeah. can figure it out. That's when we send, uh, send them to you. Exactly. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you, that's, that's so interesting. Like, you know, I was reading after I gave birth, I became then formerly infertile because now mm-hmm. if I'm not infertile anymore, I have a baby. So what do you mean you have infertility? Yeah. You don't, you had a baby. So there's that whole piece, but you know, obviously you're in this space and you're in, you know, the whole mental health aspect. When did you decide to be, go into bariatric therapy? Was it before or after (laughs) you had surgery? (laughs) No, uh, I thought what on God's earth will I be able to help people with? I haven't figured this out either. No. So I became a therapist a couple years before I had bariatric surgery, but I was working in family planning and perinatal work. And so uh, actually one of the reasons I had surgery is I had a client that I was in their home visiting, uh, helping them prepare for their pregnancy. And she looked at me and she goes, you're going to come in my house and tell me I need to take care of myself. You don't look like you've taken care of yourself a day in your life, which I understood her anger and I understood it had really had nothing to do with me. And I totally understood that she was probably accurate. Uh, But it was funny because later on in my career, I had a client that I was working on with something and she looked at me and she goes, what do you know about being fat? Doesn't look mm. like you've had a fat day. I was like, Girl, we cannot win. We cannot win. But wow. you can, which is part of why you can't do this for other people, but because you, you won't win in that way. But so I 
Oh man, I think I waited six years, five or six years. And I just put, I just kind of had my toe in it in the beginning before I went like full fledged. Uh, I went fully committed to full time bariatrics in 2019, 2018. Wow. Is when I okay. So six years you've been in this mm-hmm. space. Yeah. Um, and not only that, you are now expanding to not just you know, your work, you have additional therapists, you have this very, very (laughs) flourishing business in helping to prepare patients before, after surgery, all of the things that you do, but you're also helping other therapists, mental health providers in making sure that you kind of like scale it in a way that they can take all of your learnings, personal experience, patient, you know, anecdotal stories and be able to spread it more. I think that's so cool. How do you, how do you like that new aspect that this business has taken for you? So I love teaching other therapists. I love, I've always, I've been a qualified supervisor. So in the state of Florida, when you get your license, we're under licensed for a while and then you're fully licensed and you work with a a fully licensed person in order to get licensed. So I've been doing that for a long time and I love, I love that type of work. Um, And so the, that's nothing new to me specifically for bariatrics is. So what I figured out is I went on a couple podcasts that were client facing and I got all these reach outs and they're like, Hey, do you have someone? Um, can I see you? And I had to say no, cause we're license dependent for the state. I said, but I'll find you someone in Mississippi. Sure. So I would yeah. go out and try to find people that were educated in bariatrics and I really wasn't finding it. And so I kind of simultaneously, I had already Um, part of it too, which I think a lot of people can relate to this in my brain, why was I the expert? Like I, I was not an expert in this. I was an expert in my own experience. And, and I had a, a a business coach actually, that was like, well, if you can't accept that you're the expert, then accept that you're really organized. You got templates. You can teach people how to be more organized. You can teach (laughs) people education. I was like, yeah, I could buy that. And she was like, there you go. She's like, yeah, okay. Just package it a little differently. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So I was like, oh, okay. Expert, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> but okay. And the funny thing is I, I realized after the fact, even the definition of an expert, I technically am. So I was like, okay, I just had to kind of get over that hump. I think there's a lot of fear around, like, if you put yourself out there as an expert and then people come and also bariatrics, I'm sure Dr. Dovic, you've ran into this. Uh, it's really controversial in our, in the therapy community. I have been yelled at. I've been told mm-hmm. that I'm filling eating disorder clinics up because I'm not like passing appropriate people. And then I have to educate how like, we don't pass fail people. This is like informed consent is all we're really, I I literally just had this and it was actually a a, a client, uh, not a client, another bariatric uh, person that posted on Instagram, how like if um, we really did um, psyche valves, people would be in the loony bin instead of the the operating room. And I was like, yeah, so I do those evals. Um, that's not how this works. And I think yeah, it was no. actually a really good exchange and like educational exchange. And, and I, and I love that person. I know who they are, but it just was a very weird, it's a very weird thing, even for bariatric patients to say that, but like, we, we believe that people have body autonomy and can make their own choice surrounding surgery. That seems off or odd to some therapists. So we kind of get it from both sides. So we get it from the eating disorder community to say like, everyone who's obese has an eating disorder. So why are you passing them? Which is ridiculous. They don't. And the other side of kind of the fat acceptance movement or um, haze to say, uh, you shouldn't be telling people to have surgery. And so there's some education there to tell them we are not telling anyone to have surgery. Right. Um, we are helping them understand what will happen. And so they can make that choice. Um, but I also, if we truly believe it health at every size, that includes in a smaller body too. And so again, people have the ability to make their own decisions and body autonomy. And so, you know, so to put myself out there as a therapist saying like, I'm going to teach bariatrics, uh, there is some vulnerability for a whole bunch of people to yell at me, which they did. Uh, And then I figured out it's fine. Like I got much better at like what I was going to say when that happened. And I can still stand firm in that. I think oftentimes people also don't realize the mean things that they're saying about bariatrics. They're saying it about me too. Mm -hmm. So if they're saying that, obesity is an eating disorder. They're saying I had an eating disorder right. and I didn't. I had a metabolic condition <laughs> that I could like very clearly pinpoint. 
Um, and so it really exposes bias that I wish we did not have. You would think in the therape therapeutic community, would we wouldn't have biases around that, but we do. Uh, we have lots of biases. So I think that has been a really fun shift and it wasn't as painful as I thought it would be. Uh, and we're educating a lot of people. I'm actually working on like, uh, I'm going to put it out there. So I actually do it. Um, I'm Very working on actually um, a new training for therapists that talks about um, the focusing on the skills. So the right now I, I have a training that's for pre-surgical. And then mostly if you do coaching with me, then you learn, I teach you the skills. So kind of the pre-op, post-op maintenance and um, regain or weight recurrence. So I have, I'm developing the trainings now that go into like 10 major skills for each set and how you teach it. And then it can be turned into a support group guide as well. So um, like a provider could come and run a support group. And for the clients who are listening, yay, I'm turning all of that information into a journal that I'll sell on, on oh. Amazon. So it'll have the 10 skills in the front. It will have tracking in the back, uh, but it will oh. not have traditional tracking. It will be fo focused more on failure is learning experiences. So mm -hmm. mindset around failure. So like changing that to like, what did I learn from that situation? What can I move forward? And then it'll have all the skills in the front. So if you needed to, like, oh. I'm getting stuck, you can go to the front and be like, okay, emotional eating, um, step one, step two, let me, let me try this and then track some of the thoughts that I'm having about that. Um, so hopefully, because that like doesn't exist. It's weird. I went on Amazon. It doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. it's, wow. it's something that Filling definitely could be used. Yeah. And yeah. I already that have is super cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, when you know we thought about putting together like a, a food mood journal, mm -hmm. which sounds like what you're kind of doing. Like, if I'm eating this, what emotion am I feeling? And it's hard, you know, for us to even identify emotions beyond happy, sad, mad. You know, mm -hmm. how do you like? Do you teach like identifying? The deeper feeling. I feel very lonely right now. Like yeah. how, like when you're talking about this journal, like how would you, how would you advise somebody? Because I'd open it up and I'd be like, all right, lay it at that cheese stick. Now, what, what do I, yeah. like, how do yeah. I, like, you know, you want to take it seriously yeah, right? yeah. and you want to be, be able to help yourself with it, but like, how do you do it? So it's interesting that you say cheese stick. Cause I bet you, I know what you might've been looking for. So when I start, I don't start with emotions because that's really tough. I'll be honest with you, that's tough for me because as a therapist, we like cut ourselves off from a lot of emotions. So like in the beginning, if you tell me how I feel, I'd be like, I don't know. So what I ask people first, <laughs> is, what did you actually need? So you're standing in front of the refrigerator, you've opened up the refrigerator, you're like, I am not hungry, but here I am looking around for something. What are you needing? Am I needing mm -hmm. satisfaction? Am I needing um, connection? Am I needing something to do? Am I needing fulfillment? Am I need, yeah. like, what do you actually need in that moment? Do we need to phone a friend? Well, it's 2 a.m. Okay, so we can't phone a friend. So maybe we go on Instagram. Maybe we watch friends because that's the thing that like reminds us that we have community, that we know we know what's going to happen. It feels um, connective, connectiveness and that's okay. So I think that we really want to get into the emotions of it, though, are important kind of when we dig into deeper stuff, like why would you feel you need a satisfaction in the middle of the night? Um, that's kind of a deeper potential therapy thing. But what I actually needed in the moment, I actually can connect to. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those thoughts, particularly if you're someone who has ADHD or neurodivergent, you may not even realize when you're doing it, which is like a weird, like myself included, like I figure it out. Like after I've gotten back to the couch, I flipped it and now I'm looking in the bowl and there's no more in there. And I'm like, oh, Oops. yes. Yeah. Uh. There's also just patterns. So when I sit down to do admin work, I noticed this funny pattern. I had to go in the kitchen and get a snack. And I was like, I do a lot of admin work. So I can't be getting up and getting snacks all day long. What is that from? Yep. Oh, when I was a kid, when you came home from school, before you did the homework, which I really wow. didn't want to do, you ate mm -hmm. a snack. So yep. this is a normal, natural a cycle that your brain has figured out. So do I want to continue it? So this is kind of step two. Do I want to continue it? Do I want to like it in that moment, especially, okay. So it's two o'clock in the morning, you open the fridge, like true night eating, right? You're looking at everything. Sometimes the choice may be, I actually do want to emotionally eat and I'm going to choose to do it. I'm going to do it and be done with it and call it a day. I'm not going to guilt trip myself. I'm not going to think about it all night. I'm going to then not going to sleep and then wake up the night. Like I'm going to be like, my quickest way to ending this is to have a snack and go to bed. 
Mm -hmm. So I will choose consciously versus, so what we do in therapy is I want you to make choices based on conscious decision-making versus subconscious or old crap that we do not need to. So it's, it's um, one of the big cycle or things that we'll talk about is like eating in front of people. Mm-hmm. Like, so you eat perfectly in front of people and then you eat everything else in secret. Like yeah. we got to cut that shit out. Like th- no more, no more. Like th- eat what you're going to eat. That's a huge thing. I think that yeah. happens a lot. Right. Because historically we've been told being fat is your own darn fault. If you didn't eat all that stuff, you wouldn't be fat. So you're yeah. feeling it in front of other people. I have to prove to them that I am worthy of being here by having the smallest, most perfect plate. And then I'll go home and eat the things that I want. And now I'm going to be driven by shame and guilt instead mm. of I, I'm doing what I want to do to feel healthy. So again, shame and guilt comes up a lot. Um, that usually drives the bus. We want to like remove that driver and put it in a seat in the back, be driven by conscious decision-making and, and you know, feeling good about our decisions. Like you get to go to Universal and get Sprinkles cupcakes. Oh no, it's Voodoo, don- Voodoo Donuts. You can <laughs> do that, but I want you to make a conscious decision. I want you to eat some protein before so you don't get sick on the next ride. I want you to be like, I'm yes, really looking yes. forward to this. I want this. Uh, that This weekend, my, my, my mom lives near a Cronut. It's like the donuts that look like- Oh they're, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, they're amazing. And so I'm like, okay, like think this out. We're going to get a couple. We cut them up. We had breakfast. I made sure I had protein. Like I'm in a really good place. I had a couple bites. They were delicious. They were satisfying. I ate them and then I was done. I did not think about all day how, oh my God, I can't believe as a bariatric therapist that I ate donuts. Like, no, like cut that, cut all, like that's what we talk about a lot. I'm like, okay, because sometimes we can't, we feel like we don't have a lot of control over our thoughts. Sometimes we have control over to say like, this thought is dumb and I'm done with it. Um, I don't need that anymore. I I really can enjoy donuts. That it, it does not mean that I'm an out of control, terrible bariatric patient. It means that I wanted a donut. I ate some of it. I felt satisfied. I'm good. I moved on. Yeah. And you moved on to the next meal. It's interesting. I just thought of a, something that happened to me the other day. It's completely unrelated, but that idea of like having kind of control over your own thoughts. So I grocery shop at Aldi. Um, I don't know if you've ever shot. I know you don't grocery shop, yeah. but- if you've ever shopped at Aldi, it's like the checkout is like the fastest thing in the world, right? That's kind of one of the things they're known for. They don't bag your groceries for you. They just put them into the cart. And then there's like oh. a separate baggage area. It's all cost cutting measures, right? So Aldi's super cheap. Anyway, I go, I'm by myself and there's nobody in line or there's like one dude in front of me in the line. He only has like three things. Well, they're so fast. I always feel like I have to have the belt like filled <laughs> up. It's like a race between me and the cashier. And we used to, before we had the baby, my husband and I would always go to the grocery store together and he would load the belt. So I didn't pay attention. I'd just be standing behind the cart, like just hanging out. So now I have to do it myself because he stays home with the baby. Anyway, so I I do this. I win. I win the race. Thank God. Then I get to the self bagging area. And all of a sudden I find myself like, I'm, I'm doing a horrible job of bagging my groceries. I'm like putting things in the weirdest places. Like things are not stacked appropriately. Like, you know, I'm like trying to do my refrigerator and my out and I'm do I'm going so, 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 so fast. And I finally catch myself and I'm like, Hannah, pause, slow down. You're not actually in a race. Right. Like I have put myself into this situation of feeling so overwhelmed. Like the store wasn't closing. You know, it was like, there was no outward pressure except for me having all of a sudden like this feeling. And it was, I I literally had to like, I may have even said my name out loud because it was just like, I caught myself in that moment, but it was like, take a second, take a breath. Okay. Now put the lettuce box in the thing. And then, you know, like it's going to be okay. It's going to take you two more minutes to put your groceries away and that's fine. And so it is, it's kind of interesting to think, you know, it is, it's like, we have to, we can consciously change those thoughts and those patterns that we have of like, all right, I'm, you know, like you said, I'm in front of the refrigerator and you may like feel like all of a sudden, like, how did I even get here? And it's like, okay, great. I caught it in that moment. And now I can take the second and say, you know what I am though, I am just going to, I'm going to eat the thing and, and be done with it. Like you said, cause that might be the fastest way or, okay, no, you know what? Let's close the fridge and I'm going to walk over to the living room and sit down for a minute. And maybe that gives me the pause to do it. And maybe I still go back to the fridge and that's what I ultimately decide okay. to do. But like, I'm going to take that minute and like, oh, it's okay. It's going to be all right. We're here. Yep, exactly. 
And I think also on your whole analogy of, you know, being in a store and feeling pressured, that's also that like, you know, we're so worried about what everybody else mm-hmm. thinks. Like, I don't want to slow somebody else down. I got to be super efficient. Like they have this model for a reason. I don't want to be, you know, the weak link in this yeah, whole, exactly. like bagging of grocery saga. Yeah. But I mean, but that's how we are with a lot of different mm-hmm. things. And, you know, it's just how public perceives us. And I mean, I just really want to highlight your point about, you know, even growing up, anybody that I knew who struggled with their weight, who, you know, had the disease of obesity in hindsight, that's what they had. And, you know, I always think about eating with them publicly, no matter what it was, whatever meal it was, whatever environment situation we were in, how they would be perfect and how we would all every time comment like, man, you're the healthiest eater. And it was like, I was like eating the cycle for them too of shame and guilt. And boy, like, Oh, that just hit a chord that I wish I could go back in time and be like, ah, oh, I don't know. Like, how do you even break that for somebody? That's really, really hard. And I think, yeah, that's tough. I think that a lot of things about external pressure and what other people think of us yeah. and how that internalizes and how we kind of manifest that is, ugh. yeah, let's don't talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Don't talk about it. Yeah. And I think even for the Aldi thing, like someone in a, a bigger size may identify that that they're afraid that other people would think they're slow because yeah. they're a larger size. And so now there's even more pressure to get things yeah. going. Yeah. And so, or are people of- looking at what's in my cart? Yes. Oh yeah. Or yeah. Yeah. Looking at eating the mm-hmm. cronut at universal, like, yeah, ma'am, you do not need that cronut, but like yeah. you were so judgy and ugh, yeah. so many things. Did you, were you tall as a child, as tall as you are now, Dr. Dove? Oh Yeah. Did very, you very feel tall. Like- Both of my parents are six two, so I was always the tallest, always the tallest. And then girls are taller than boys. So, I mean, when I was in fifth grade, I was five four. I do remember that kind of, you know, like how some people they might remember their weight. In fifth grade, I was one hundred thirty pounds or whatever. I know that I was five four, and then I even grew um, after I went to college. I grew until I was like twenty. I was like five nine, and wow. now I'm like six foot. So. I grew a few more inches. I was like, oh my God. It's common for women to grow. Yeah. So weird. Yeah. It was so weird. I had to like buy all new clothes. I was, I was an adult. I was yeah. you know, like still growing. And growth spurt. Kind of concerned that I'm having a growth spurt as a sophomore at Penn State. Like, this is weird. Like, I'm not fitting on the, the twin bed anymore. Like, it's odd. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've always been very tall. And actually, I was always very, very introverted. I know you do not believe me. When no, I was but- around my inner... I remember my friends who were tall and like their goal, I remember because I was fat and they were tall. So we got along really well because like they wanted to shrink and I wanted to shrink. And so like there was this understood thing between us that it was like we both feel really awkward in our bodies right now. And how yeah. can I be smaller? And I was curious. I know now you certainly you're not that way. But if there there was like some kind of uh, thing you went through to like just be like, I'm tall, get over it. Like for everyone else. Yes. That did not happen until not all that long ago. I'm going to say like 20s, 30s. And then as I've been in attending, I mean, I could go on and on about my own second. Can, can we schedule us aside yeah. of our yeah. um, conversation for therapy here? <laughs> but yeah, I think, you know, yes, I never struggle with my weight, um, but I had a lot of other insecurities, um, had terrible hair, terrible teeth have glasses that I'm very, um, my vision is awful. Like I'm legally blind. And so I, I I have a thing, like no one can ever see me with my glasses. Um, I don't know, like, who cares? Like you look great. I mean, you have glasses right now. And I'm like, you look, I don't think anything of you being like, Oh my God, Ash is wearing glasses. Yeah. Yeah. Right. (laughs) You look great. You look perfect. Yeah, no, it is. It is a weird thing. I think that it's this like very much awareness of our own stuff. And we assume that everyone else, like I know when I was in a larger body, I was always aware of how other people perceived space and how I perceive space. I'm also somebody who's like very super visual. I can parallel park really well. So um, sometimes that could be problematic when you're in a larger body because you're very aware of how much space you take up. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so you're kind of always thinking about that. And so it is hard when that is so much of your identity, it is very hard to give that up and be who are you now. So really good example is, um, at least when I was plus size, we had like three stores. 
We had Lane Bryant, which was a little too old. Tord, which was oh, a yes. little too old. Oh, but, yes. Uh, and we had Ashley Stewart. I don't know if she uh, is Eddie Bore. It was uh, it was more targeted, um, not necessarily for my age group, uh, but they had fun stuff. I don't know if Ashley Stewart's around, if, she, if they're still around. And we had Girlfriends LA when I was young, which was a catalog. Um, it had all sizes. It was, I think, one of the first ones that had like all sizes. But it's like, I remember when I no longer could shop there in any of those stores. And then I had to go into like a normal store or, at, you know, at that time, you know, they didn't have a lot of plus in stores. I would be like, well, what am I supposed to wear now? I have four sections in Kohl's. I have juniors. I have the old lady section. Wow. I have mm -hmm. this section and I have petites. I can kind of go in all sides. I have no idea what to do. It was much yeah. easier when I could go into Torrid or Lane Bryant. They'd be like, this is what's in season this year. And I'd be like, all right, it's what we did yeah. two years ago. I, I remember this. This looks good. This doesn't. <laughs> so it is, it is. And that's kind of more of a, a, a minor thing and kind of figuring out who you are now. But I think for a lot of people, particularly think of one, uh, one of, uh, of your uh, patients who's on Instagram, if so much of your life has been being accepting of, of your size, and then you want to change yes. that, who will you become now? And yes. I think it's even more of a struggle now with social media, because that can create a lot of like your identity. Um, I was thank thank very thankful I did not have that. Uh, <laughs> we, we didn't, I don't, I don't think Instagram was around when I had surgery, but um, cause I didn't connect with the bariatric community. I was very secretive about my surgery, which is more common back then. Um, mm -hmm. I wasn't kind of out, I think until my fifth year surgery anniversary. Mm -hmm. I think that's when I first like publicly. Wow. Yeah. I publicly acknowledged that I even had bariatric surgery. So, um, so yeah, a very interesting, you know, side thing. I think nowadays it's a lot more, we talk about it more. It's a lot more accepting it's out there. Um, but I had also kind of lived of the rise and the fall of lap band, uh, which was a oh, weird wow. time to be a bariatric patient because um, lap band had such, and I lived in Jacksonville at the time, which had one of the biggest providers, he's still there, of lap band. And so mm -hmm. there were a lot of people in my work or other places um, that had not done well uh, at all or had right. some pretty awful things, you know, due to the lap band. So I also probably was quiet from a standpoint of I didn't want people to think I had lap band and that that, you know, what had happened to them would happen to me. Um, at that time, I I had a more what they had considered, you know, extreme version. Uh, I had gastric bypass. But, uh, it you know, so again, like people had feeling, well, of those who are still with lap, why wouldn't you just have lap band? It's less invasive, you know. But yeah. ironically, 12 years ago, my bariatric surgeon saw the writing on the the window for uh you know lap band it was like yeah we don't do those anymore and that was 12 years ago so you know i think it's it's a it was a very interesting time and a very different time to be a bariatric patient 12 years ago than it is now uh where there's a lot more celebrities even who've come out and been honest about their their surgery yeah that's so interesting. I know it's funny because I just got a call um, to our office, somebody requesting lap band. And I was like, we don't do that. But have you heard about bariatric surgery? Exactly. I'm like, check us out. Because um, it is, it's, you know, we we now see people kind of downstream from that. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, oh, gosh, get this thing out of me or it's not working. But that's just, that's another whole tangent yes. of the lap band. <laughs> Seriously. No, there's, there's a lot of considerations. And I know that it, it is you know, brave choice, I think, to put yourself, like you said, vulnerably out there on display for public commentary when you do identify as, you know, I love my body, I love myself, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, bigger, and I think I know which patient you're talking about, and she has, like, a huge following as yeah. this plus-sized person, mm -hmm. and now that she's losing weight and loving life and being able to move and, like, ride a bike, which she couldn't do before, and all these incredible things, I think it's... I don't know how it would feel. I mean, you have all these huge wins and it's like about me. And, and at one point you can say, I'm so happy, like, like with this choice that I made, but also when you see your following, like, mm, like she's different. Like, like you yeah. said, like, oh, you're, um, you're the bitch now that you lost yeah. weight or, or what have you. So she's lost followers, which obviously these people, you don't know, have hundreds of thousands of friends. Like these are strangers mm -hmm. and 
again, you know, they, they can be your biggest supporter or maybe even um, blocking you, writing these negative things, you know, saying that everybody needs to go to a loony bin, all that kind of, all of that consideration. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, there's a lot, a lot of things there and I don't know how, you know, boy, that just layers another thing of complexity on yeah. the whole situation. But that's why we have people like you, Ashlyn. Exactly. You can say, please go see her. Yeah. She's really good at this. She and is really knows good. way more than we do. And so much so that we wanted you to have, have you come on to this podcast today so that we could promote our upcoming support group we are doing in April. Yeah. And that is the third Wednesday of April. Okay, April. I'm like full trying to here trying to my calendar. calendar. Yeah. So on Wednesday, April 17th at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern via Zoom, go to bodybybariatrics.com to our four patients events link. You can subscribe to our calendar. Mm-hmm. We are going to be having a live interactive support group for our patients led by Ashlyn, where mm-hmm. she is going to be there and give you some of this personalized um, advice and coaching to the questions and the needs that you have. Yeah. I'm like on this. We are yeah. so excited. Sometimes it, the two of us were always droning on and on. And <laughs> we we need we need we need you to know, flavor. You know, we need we need that in there for the support. We have to admit we don't know everything, which we is hard not. for us to do. We do not know any everything. And I told I have such muscle memory. I was telling Hannah right before we came on with you. I was like, gosh, like you want to ask me about the technical aspects of creating a gastrojejunostomy and exactly the sizing tube and the way I do it and the all the angles. I have such mem- muscle memory explaining those procedures. I, I mean, it's, I don't even, I'm not, I'm thinking about something else while I'm talking about it. Like I've gotten to that point, mm-hmm. but like, I have to be fully engaged when I'm talking about feelings side of this journey. Like mm-hmm. I, I don't have muscle memory on this. Like this is something that I also need to be better surgeon provider of bariatric care and really like lean into every word that you're saying mm-hmm. and truly take notes. Like I said earlier. Yeah. 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 And it's so difficult because you. everybody is so different that, you know, even if like our stomachs tend to look all the same, but you know, how yeah. our backgrounds, the messaging we received, all that is so different person to person, you know, mm-hmm. why something brings up something in someone versus some, it doesn't bring up in someone else is different. And I think that's why the mental health, like individual work in mental health is so important because we need to figure out for you why that's occurring. Yeah. So where do people find you if they want, obviously you you work with patients in the state of Florida, um, but you might be able to to provide for other places. Hopefully you have, you're building your network there. So, but where do people find you? Um, Social media website. Yeah. So um, if you are outside of the state of Florida and you are just looking for a bariatric therapist, I run findabariatrictherapist.com. Uh, We have many, many providers throughout the United States who specifically are trained and specialize in bariatric surgery. If you are a bariatric uh, therapist, we would love to also have you on board. There's a way for you to sign up. Um, So find a bariatric therapist.com or at find a bariatric therapist on Instagram. If you're looking for me specifically, if you want to look at my personal page where I do meal prepping and and bariatric adventures, all sorts of fun things. um, I am Ashlyn change the number for life 2012. Um, that's more my personal, though public facing page. And then uh, Advanced Bariatric Counseling is my bariatric page for my business. And then uh, bar- uh, Bariatric Business, no, Bariatric Therapy Business Coach. <laughs> I think that's right. Is my bariatric one. therapy business coach page. That that's for providers who are looking to get into bariatrics. I post daily on almost all of my accounts. Um, either tips, tricks, um, yeah, either specific job. For, yeah, specific for clients or specific for, um, providers, but each account has get something almost every day. Um, and then, yeah, so those are all my hands. I have so many, have like five social hands. media. I know we did the same yeah. thing. We're here. We're here. We're here. We're here. I know <laughs> Hannah's like, switch it up. I'm like, I know I'm trying, but <laughs> mommy is tired. Very, very tired. Yes. And I am too old for TikTok. So I am at currently, I am only on Instagram. All on Instagram. All right. Noted. I, same. I mean, I try to do it and I'm like, why do I get like tens and tens of likes? That's it. Like what is yeah, going on? It. Like everybody else is getting viral. I'm like, oh, well, yeah. that's a whole other thing. So while 
Absolutely awesome. I'm um, chatting with you today. Yes. I hope everybody on here will be on our support group uh, next month in April. Um, you just bring so much great perspective, personal, mm -hmm. professional, um, in what you do. Your expertise is just outstanding. Yes. I love chatting with you. And just a really random side note to end this. Um, you know, <laughs> I've always been watching Ashlyn on all of these social media handles that she has. And I, I've known her and we kind of like direct messaging each other but it's like one of those like stranger things like oh clapping hands or no like she responded to my stories I do hers great and then she asked me a question about if I would look over some of her stuff for oh. the you know the training of well, the bariatric met. therapist and I was like yeah I'll do it and I said I would do it and I wanted to do it and I hadn't done it then the two of us randomly unbeknownst to each other were flying from Orlando to Vegas to see Adele on different nights, but we were both going there and I was just sitting in the airport and she's like, Betsy Dovek. And I'm like, <laughs> Ashlyn Douglas Barnes, what is this? And okay. so we sat by each other. So Our plane was delayed like one. five hours. Oh, yeah. You know this? Yeah, I remember. Oh, you guys like went live together, didn't and you? She went live and then like, we like planned this whole thing and now yeah. like, through friends because we had this, I didn't even want the plane to go, which was kind of crazy. Cause it's like, don't you want to get to Vegas? My sister's like, are you so mad? I'm like, no, no. actually <laughs> the greatest thing happened. To yeah. Me. Serendipitous. It was. And we, yeah. it was serendipitous. And I truly know that that, that chance meeting of being isolated together for five, six hours waiting was not just by chance. I don't know. I felt like that was no. crazy. So, and it was funny because I told my friend, I was like, I think that's Dr. Dovic over there, but I don't. And I knew it was you because you had with your podcast shirt on. I'm like, it definitely is. Of course I'm like, I did. Have <laughs> podcast shirt on. Yeah, I was like, I'm gonna leave her alone. And my and my friend was like, Yeah, yeah, you should leave. I was like, Oh, I should leave her alone. And I like went. I was like, Fuck it. I was like, Let's go over. Let's talk. I was like, Hey, like I think you know me. I think I know you. But you were so friendly. I was like so surprised. <laughs> so like, poor lady wants to get on this plane. We're delayed. Uh, yeah, no, that was, uh, was the, the, the man on that flight too, that was removed or was it on the one home? No, it was on the one there. Oh no, no, no. Sorry. That was the, I, I went to, uh, ASMBS and to Vegas as well. We had a man reviewed and there was a bariatric surgeon that was in front of me. Anyway, sorry. Another time, oh, another story for another time. Every time I go to Vegas on um, what, where are we at frontier? Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. The that, that was, yeah. yeah. Cause the flights from Orlando to Vegas are terrible. It's all in frontier. But anyways, yeah. thank you guys so much for having me. I super appreciate yes. it. I can't wait for uh, future future events and things for us all to do. Yes. Well, thank you for, for joining. And I'm going to do our quick plug here. Yeah. Find us on Instagram at Dr. X Dietitian, at Dr. Dovek, at hannahskyler.rd, at Body by Bariatrics. We'll be sure to be sharing the link for that support group next month. Yes. Um, and check us out there. And we're always happy to answer questions. And I know Ashlyn's always happy to to chat with people as well. So um, thanks again for joining and we will see you all next time. Bye guys. Bye. Bye.